Last night, I dreamt I went to Manderley again. Seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive. And for a while, I could not enter, for the way was barred to me. Manderley, secretive and silent. Time could not mar the perfect symmetry of those walls. Moonlight can play odd tricks upon the fancy. And suddenly it seemed to me that light came from the windows. OK, welcome back to Film Talk, and I'm delighted to say we are adding yet another great film to our list of the top 100 films ever made, at least the best 100 films in our humble opinion. I'm joined by the fantastic Phil Campbell. Thank you. One half of the Hammer Runners, lifetime in the film industry, nothing he doesn't know about films. So uh, where else would you have any... Who else would you have on the programme to talk about these? Yeah. And our contribution to the top 100 this time is... The contribution today is Rebecca. Rebecca? You could say Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca or Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, as she wrote the book. Um, 1940, the first uh, film uh, Alfred Hitchcock made in America, made in Hollywood. That's right, yes. Previously he'd done all his films in, in Britain. Things like you know, 39 Steps and mm. early ones like Blackmail. All done over here, but he got the opportunity to do this in, in the States, um, which is quite a, a plus for him. And he had Laurence Olivier played Maximum de Winter, the lead character, and Joan Fontaine played Mrs. de Winter. Uh, you never know what her first name is. Her first name doesn't come up at all. When you first see Joan Fontaine, she's mm. actually working with... Uh, Mrs. Van Hopper, who's basically, they're in Monte Carlo, and Mrs. Van Hopper is an elderly, very, very rich lady, and Joan Fontaine plays her accompaniment, a companion, if you like. That's right, yeah. They used to do things like that. She just does all the bits and pieces for her. Um, but you never know what her name is. Even when they first meet Laurence Olivier, uh, Max de Winter, out there, um, you never hear what her first name is at all, always through the whole film. Eventually, obviously, she falls in love with Laurence Olivier, and they get married... So she becomes Mrs. De Winter from that moment on. Okay. And he always calls her dear, darling, or you little fool, <laughs> when he's upset with her, which is mm -hmm. a, bit, a bit rude. But um, so the story is, yes, they, she meets him in Monte Carlo. He's recently, uh, his wife has died. That's Rebecca. His wife uh, has died and he's sort of getting over that. And um, he falls in love. They fall in love with each other. They go back to this wonderful house down in the West Country called Mandalay. Mm. Um, and she is very shy. She's very sort of, um, not innocent, but she's very shy and, 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 and finds it a huge struggle to be in this house full of all these servants and suddenly thrown into this huge responsibility. And it isn't helped by um, Danvers. Mrs Danvers is the housekeeper played by Audrey, oh no, sorry, Judith Anderson, who had a real thing about Rebecca. She thought Rebecca was the bee's knees. So she doesn't like the idea of... Uh, Max De Winter picking up this new girl, a new wife, mm. who is doesn't know anything about society, doesn't know what to do, um, and they have a, a a bit of a a bit of a problem there. So the story develops in that way that you know she's she's in the house, she doesn't know what to do. She does silly things like she'll break up an ornament and quickly hide it away in the drawer, don't tell anybody, rather than just coming out and saying it because she's embarrassed about it all. And when they find out, they think one of the servants has broken it or stolen it. And uh, she has to own up to it. And he says, oh, you little fool, don't do things like this. And she's just... But she's absolutely gorgeous, Joan Fontaine. She's really, really um, adapts to it as best she can. And she's quite a strong character. She's, she's not a weak character, but you just get so... The sympathy for her is quite quite strong because you mm. think she's thrown into this situation. Um, apparently, when shooting, because um, Lawrence Olivier wanted his wife, uh, Vivian Lee, to play the part, he really pushed for it and eventually the producer, David O'Selznick, and Alfred Hitchcock went with Joan Fontaine. He wasn't terribly happy and he wasn't actually very nice to her on set, which Hitchcock thought was great because it gave her this sort of... Real attention. Yeah, attention mm. and standoffness between the two of them. You know, she felt quite kind of bad about it and it sort of it worked very well to make the film happen. Um, yeah, Daphne du Maurier's novel, which and that's the best thing about the film. This is why I like it as a film. I could have picked lots of Hitchcock movies because... You've got Psycho, you've got Spellbound I really like. Absolutely. Um, you know, Real Window, which Morris did, is, is really good as well. But it's the story of Rebecca which makes the whole film, and it happens to be directed by Alfred Hitchcock, which makes it even even better, make it, makes it all work. Um, as a film, 
is, is the thing. Uh, and it's, it's got lots of twists and turns. It starts a bit slow. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of scenario you think is going to develop. Oh, yes, she struggles to look after the household and does all the wrong things. And Mrs Danvers pushes her in the wrong direction, gets her to wear uh, a dress for a special party because... She says, oh, 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 Max, he loves this dress, and it's the complete opposite, he hates it, because in the end, you discover he wasn't in love with his wife, Rebecca, at all. She was a complete and utter nightmare, but that follows along in the story. This is all the twists that happen. Mm. So all the time, um, poor old Joan Fontaine, or apparently in the early strip, they called her um, Daphne to give her a name, but they got rid of it eventually, Daphne de Moreau being yes, the writer. Yes, <laughs> Well, that was quite a thing, but they uh, they uh, elbowed that soon after and kept it as she's just the girl or Mrs. De Winter. Mm. Um, yeah, lots of twists and turns happen. Uh, that's what I like about it. At the end story, you think it's all sorted, and then it isn't. You think you know what's happened, and then oh, it's not. It's got a twist it's on changed. it. Changed. Yeah, it'll change. But um, it was. Um, it, it's a great. It's a great film. Um, I, I say the producer David Selznick was quite a, a controlling character. Mm. And he was busy doing Gone with the Wind. So apparently when it's finished, the cut sort of sat on the shelf for a few months before he had a chance to really look at it and make amendments. He went back and reshot certain bits and pieces. Nothing to change Hitchcock's uh, cut as such, but he certain I felt things like at the end with the, the burning sequence and uh, the aura of Rebecca, which is on a, uh, a napkin or something, is getting consumed by flames. And it wasn't quite centred. He didn't like that. He wanted it in the middle and the flames consume it like that. So it's all very neat. He went back and reshot these bits and pieces, apparently. He's a bit of a perfectionist with all the cells, isn't he? I think so, yes, mm. when you see it. And what an amazing cast, too. I mean, it's a yeah. superb lineup of, of talent in the film. Yeah, uh, yeah, Lawrence Olivier, Joan Fontaine. And then there were people like George Sanders was in it and Gladys Cooper, people like yeah. that, playing characters. And it all worked uh, just very well. It just somehow, when you watch it, there aren't any real, there's no problems with it at all. Apart from the only complaint I have about Hitchcock being a slightly lazy director, is using back projection an awful lot. I understand using it when you're in car journeys and things like this, but he uses it when there's a shop and they go on the beach, and you can see it's a double, the two of them going down steps on the beach. And when they arrive on the beach, it's just a projected backdrop, and they're talking. It's like he couldn't be bothered to go on location. At any point, even though he's in America with a plenty of location, but maybe O'Sullivan wouldn't let him go on location. True, true. They might have had a budget constraint, but the fact you're going to go out there and shoot an exterior shot with with extras, mm. then why, why not you just do it? And he does it a lot. But when they're walking along as well, and, the, and the, the footage starts moving, and a tree goes past like that, you know, it's just, I just, why did you do that? I think, why did you do it? Because it, every, at other times, he's so particular about lining up certain really interesting shots, camera mm. movements and focus pulls and all that sort of thing. And, and it works in this. when There's, there's a sequence when um, uh, poor old <laughs> Joan Fontaine's had, a, had enough, really. This dress she tries on and she realises she's done it wrong yet again and Max is all annoyed with her and she just can't do anything right. And, and um, Danvers takes her up to Rebecca's bedroom, she discovers, which is the only, only room in the, in, the, in the Mandalay which overlooks the sea and opens the window and they're looking down in the courtyard and she just, just sort of whispers in her ear, you don't, you don't belong here, you don't want to be here. Look at that down there, why don't you just do it? But trying to persuade her after she's broken down in tears and having a nervous breakdown, she chucks herself out the window. And it's all these, these shots get closer and closer and, you know, you can really see it. And then suddenly there's a bolt of lightning and it wakes sort of Joan Fontaine up from mm. knows what's going on and she rushes out of the room. Um, but all stuff like that he can use so well. But then it's in the studio, I suppose. He likes to be studio orientated at that time. I think that Mandalay was an actual model because they had to burn it at the end. That's uh, right, yeah, catches yeah. fire, doesn't it? And it, it starts with this most famous quote, one of the most famous quotes of any book was, last night I dreamt I went back to Mandalay again. And lots of people use that. They've actually used it in other sort of films, intro thing, very sort of mimicking it, you know, mm. as, a, as a homage to it, but... Yeah, it's the story, it's Hitchcock, it's, it's Lawrence Olivier, Joan Fontaine, being very good. Won the Best Picture Oscar. Not the best director for him, unfortunately, but the Best Picture, which was something for him. Uh, well, Best Director is something he, that eluded him his entire career. That's right, yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? You think you'd give it to him, like, they gave one to John Wayne for True Grit. He wasn't particularly good in it, but they thought we'd better give him one. Well, before it's too late. Exactly. Yeah, they, exactly. they could have done the same with Alfred Hitchcock, really, couldn't they? I think you got a special Oscar or something, didn't you? A special award, I think something like that. A British one over here, BAFTA probably, fellowship mm. and all that, which is good. But yeah, 
And of course, Judith Anderson, Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers, yes, a, a very powerful performance, really. And apparently Hitchcock asked her not to blink as much as possible to keep wow. her this staring, sort of rather ghostly image. And she doesn't really walk. I mean, she obviously walks, but every time they shot her, they shot her from sort of just the sort of knees upwards or closer. Mm. So she appears to glide through shot a lot of the time. Very like ghostly. A, like a, yeah, ghostly, but like a vampire. But yeah, a wonderful character. Yeah. Judith Anderson. Mm. Interesting. So there we are. That is Rebecca, Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. One of the greatest films of all time, certainly in our opinion, and in Phil's opinion too, and a great contribution to our list. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.